Hello and welcome to lecture number two. Today, we'll address Michigan's economy with a particular focus on the lumber industry. There are a few themes to be addressed in this presentation. First of all, we'll explore the concept of extractive industries. Lumbering was an extractive industry. Then we'll look at some of the traits of lumbering in Michigan. And then I'd like to use local history as a case study with a particular focus on the history of Mason and Manistee counties. We'll begin with the discussion of extractive industries. Now, there are a range of examples of extractive industries. These could begin with maybe the fur trade with Native Americans and European exploration, then the lumber industry, mining, mining of coal, mining of salt and other minerals, copper, things like that. Um, and agriculture or farming are also examples of extractive industries. But today, I want to focus on the lumber industry. There are three main results of an economy that's based exclusively on extractive industries like Michigan's. First of all, it requires a cheap and easy transportation system in order to deliver those products to a market. Secondly, the economy is characterized by periodic booms and busts. Lastly, what we'll see is that the environment is altered at a very high pace. Often, economic prosperity leads to environmental destruction. Michigan has a rich lumbering heritage, and in fact, from the end of the Civil War to about 1890, Michigan produced more finished lumber than any other state in the United States. There were several cities that where the lumber industry was focused, Saginaw and Bay City, as well as Muskegon and Grand Rapids. The areas circled in black on this map identify the key lumber regions for the state of Michigan, Saginaw to the east, and then Grand Rapids and Muskegon. Here we see a couple of images. On the right is the schooner W.K. Moore. This is shown transporting lumber to different markets. Throughout the Great Lakes, probably the biggest market for Michigan lumber was the city of Chicago. And we see an image of this on the left. Next, I'd like to explore the Homestead Act. This was an act passed by the government that helped to flourish settlement in the state of Michigan. Congress passed the Homestead Act in 1862. I'd like to identify three main provisions. First of all, any adult could select up to 160 acres of surveyed but unclaimed land. You could be a citizen or if you were a non-citizen, you could even qualify with this. You just had to pledge that you wanted to become an American citizen. Secondly, the land had to be occupied for at least five years and improved. Finally, after five years, the land was yours for a very low fee. Passage of the Homestead Act had a huge impact on the state of Michigan. Here we see a major population increase during the decade of the 1860s. Many people who took advantage of the Homestead Act were born outside of the United States. The circled area here identifies a lot of the blue and purple counties in Michigan as well as Wisconsin. These indicate counties where high numbers of people were living, yet they were born outside of the United States. As a result of that Homestead Act, over 3 million acres of property was handed out by the federal government. Additional land also was purchased by people who wanted to buy more land. If a person desired to purchase more land, it would cost usually about $1.25 an acre. Often, these investors would employ timber cruisers who would survey the forested lands and try to find the best land where there was lots of lumber in order to make more money. Next, I'd like to explore how Manistee County was impacted by this lumber era in Michigan's history. Here's that map once again. 
you see the arrow here is pointing to the city of Manistee. Now the word Manistee actually comes from a Native American word, an Ojibwe word meaning spirit of the woods. Native Americans lived in that area for centuries. Uh, however, the first permanent white settlers were James and Adam Stronach. They came to the area because they wanted to build a sawmill in the early 1840s. You can see the location of Stronach on the map. Now the lumber industry involved a lot of seasonal work. During the winter is when the trees were cut down. Uh, the people who were involved in the cutting down of those trees, those loggers, were often referred to as shanty boys. Uh, today we might call them lumberjacks, but in Michigan they used the phrase shanty boys. They worked long hours and the work was often really dangerous. The wages were generally pretty low, um, although they did live in barracks and they received room and board as part of their compensation. Here we see an image of some shanty boys at a winter camp. Looks pretty cold. We see a couple more images here. On the left, we see some men using a cross-cut saw, cutting a tree down. Once a tree was felled, it needed to be cut into lengths, generally about 12 feet in length. Here we see a big load of lumber being transported in the winter. They did this in the winter so that they could, it would be easier to bring the logs from the forest to alongside the rivers. The highlighted area of this map shows the location of the Manistee River. Forested areas on either side of the river were where the trees were cut down and then the logs themselves were placed right alongside the river. They were taken to rollaways like this one. In the winter, the logs were placed alongside the river, and then in the spring, they were shoved down this hill into the river where they were floated to different sawmills. Sometimes there were so many logs in the river there would be a log jam, and you can see a couple of images of this on the left. In the spring, the logs were sent down the stream in the rivers, and in the summer is the time period when the sawmills would cut those logs into finished lumber. Here we see a sawmill in Manistee. This one was owned by Louis Sands, one of the larger sawmill operators in the city. A new technology transformed the lumber industry in the state of Michigan, and it had a focus on the city of Manistee. The first of those two technologies were the big wheels, as shown here in this image. An entrepreneur from Manistee actually popularized the use of the big wheels. His name was Silas Overpack, and he's shown here. He arrived in Manistee in the late 1860s and initially established a wagon shop. He then either invented or popularized the use of those big wheels by the mid-1870s. This allowed logging to take place year-round in Michigan, and it wasn't simply going to be done during the winter. The engineering and technology associated with the big wheels transformed the industry because it allowed lumbering to take place year-round. This is a scene from the city of Manistee showing several of those big wheels ready to get shipped to different markets. Here's a manual advertising those big wheels. These were sold by Silas Overpack and those items were sold all over the state of Michigan and even were sent to other states. Salt mining was an associated industry often linked with two lumber communities. Often, wells were dug underneath Lake Michigan where a brine was brought up. That brine was then evaporated by using scrap wood and sawdust from the sawmills. Eventually, Manistee earned the nickname Salt City because as many as 2.6 million barrels of salt were produced by the 1880s 
at, by different companies in the city of Manistee. As a result of Silas Overpack's invention and the salt industry, Manistee experienced a major economic and population boom by the 1870s and 1880s. The previous slide showed some population statistics. It's also possible that the city of Manistee had more millionaires per capita than any other community in the United States. In 1867, there were 21 sawmills producing over 100 million board feet of lumber. By the 1880s, there were nearly twice as many sawmills producing over 200 million board feet of lumber. As a result of the lumber industry, Manistee experienced huge economic booms and economic prosperity. However, this was followed by bust and environmental impact. Generally speaking, those forested areas were clear-cut. Here we see the result of a clear-cut of a Michigan forest. While for much of the 1800s, Manistee experienced a population boom, this led to a plateau and an eventual bust by the early 1900s. So far we've explored extractive industries and looked at the history of Manistee County. Let's switch gears now and talk about Mason County's history. Mason County was named for Stevens T. Mason, discussed in the previous lecture, the boy governor of Michigan. The original name of Ludington was Pierre Marquette. He was named after the French missionary and explorer who was the first European to the area in the eight, excuse me, in the 1670s. We'll explore Pierre Marquette a little bit more later in the semester, but he was an important French missionary and explorer. He first established a mission in at St. Ignace in 1671, but then he died near Ludington in 1675. That's why the community of Ludington was originally named Pierre Marquette. Here we see some statistics concerning Mason County's history. We see a population boom beginning in the 1870s. One thing you should notice is that Manistee's population was much larger than, than Mason County's in this era. When studying the history of Mason County, we'll explore different personalities. The first is shown here. This is Charles Mears. He began purchasing property in Mason County in the late 1840s. He was the region's top employer for quite some time and he operated sawmills in both Ludington and Hamlin. Mears operated a few sawmills. Here we see one um, at, at the town of Lincoln. Um, this is where Epworth is located now today, uh, near Lincoln Hills Golf Course, if you're familiar with that area, on the way out to Ludington's State Park. Lincoln is a ghost town because it was abandoned by the 1860s. Here we see another important figure. This is James Ludington. He was originally born in New York, but then he lived in Wisconsin for quite some time. He never lived in Ludington, but he became an important lumber baron beginning in 1859. Eventually, by the 1870s, the town of Pierre Marquette was renamed Ludington after he donated some money to the city. James Ludington was most associated with the Pierre Marquette Lumber Company, as shown here. Here we see a third important lumber baron from the Ludington area. This is Ebert Brock Ward. He was actually from Detroit, and he was a very successful businessman. He made a fortune in the shipping industry, shipbuilding, as well as the production of iron and steel. He operated two of the largest sawmills in Mason County. There was actually some conflict between Ebert Ward and James Ludington. Prior to the 1870s, Eber Ward owned thousands of acres of timbered property on either side of the Pier Marquette River. Yet, Ward didn't have a spot where he could build a sawmill. James Ludington refused to sell him a mill site. So, when Ludington's timber crews accidentally trespassed on Ward's property, Ward had Ludington arrested on the next visit that he made to the city of Detroit. While 
Luddington was in prison, he suddenly changed his mind and sold Ward some properties in order to build his sawmills. Shocking, huh? Here we see a couple of Eber Ward's sawmills. The North Mill was an important one which, when it was completed in 1870, and it cost $60,000. But the South Mill was much larger, and when it was finished, it was believed to be the model mill in all of the state of Michigan. The final personality I'd like to address is shown here. This is Justice S. Stearns. He came to Ludington in the 1870s following the untimely death of Eber Ward. He eventually worked for Eber Ward's widow, who was his own sister-in-law. After a time, he founded his own lumber town called Stern Siding. Here we see an image that shows the settlement of Stern Siding, which was founded in 1880. This was located primarily in Lake County and had as many as 2,700 people living and working in the community. It's a ghost town today. By the late 1890s, Stearns became the largest manufacturer of lumber in the state of Michigan. He eventually would found a coal company town in Kentucky. The arrow was pointing to Stearns, Kentucky here on the map. Stearns was both an entrepreneur and philanthropist. He was involved in several different businesses in the Ludington area, including the Stearns Hotel, Stearns Power and Light, as well as the Carum Company and others. He also donated money to a wide range of different causes. Here we see a historical photo of the Stearns Hotel, as well as one that's modern. It opened for business in 1903. The Ludington area's first hospital was Polina Stearns Hospital, named for Justice Stearns' wife, Polina. Stearns initially donated his home and then eventually over $30,000 over the years to this hospital. A brand new hospital was opened in 1940, and you see that as the brick building on the bottom. Possibly the most recognizable donation that Stearns made to the city was the public beach at the end of Ludington Avenue. Now that we've explored some of the impact of Michigan's lumbering industry, I'd like to finish with some final thoughts. The focus today has been on Michigan's economy and its lumber heritage. Michigan led the nation in lumber production from the end of the Civil War to about the 1890s. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to describe Michigan's involvement in the lumber industry and then use the history of Manistee and Mason counties as a case study to show detail with Michigan's involvement in this industry. Well, that's it for today. I hope you learned something new, particularly about the communities where you live. Take care and have a great day.